from the Catania University. She is a microbiologist, and her speech today is about gram-negative bacteria resistance. Please, Stefania. Thank you. Thank you, Terzita. Thank you, the, the chairman. Thank you to the organizer that uh, have invited us to, to talk in this uh, great Congress, and uh, we hope uh, to give, you can give a contribution also on this uh, emerging problem in, in gram-negative bacteria. So just, uh, if I, I, I try to find a word that can be, uh, can explain what is going on in, uh, in our settings in infection. And the, the words that I, I found is, uh, for example, complexity. If you think what is going on in our patient is that they, we have an increasing number of complex patients, so the patient becomes more complex to treat and to be uh, studied. Also, they are complex by themselves, so there is, again, this word. And uh, what is going on is that increasing complexity of resistant phenotypes I am a microbiologist, so it means that uh, I am I, seeing what is going on in bacteria and uh, the complexity of the resistance profile are very difficult to, to understand and to treat uh, in, eventually. And the, the fourth thing is uh, there is a rapid evolution of local epidemiology of infection and resistant patterns. And also uh, what is going on in my hospital is, is not very far from what is is going on in your hospital because resistance bacteria are traveling with us. So the complexity is a problem of the, of the moment. And the, 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 <laughs> the least, at last, the least is not less important. And we, we can have an, uh, a, a talk in this symposium. We, we don't have useful drugs for treat our patient. So what is going on in gram-negative bacteria? This slide show uh, just a sort of summary of, of the major issue resistance in enterobacteria, pseudomonas ferruginosa, and acinetobacter, the three most important the nosocomial pathogen. And the, the, in the, the resistant issue are obviously, as you can see, many times multidrug resistant, pan-drug resistant, X-drug resistant. So it means there are few drugs still active on, against these pathogens. And if you start with fluoroquinolones in all these cases, you can see that also carbapenem, the last resort of therapy, is, a, is now a problem. And uh, if you look also in uh, some strains of anisinetobacter, you can see also resistance to cholestine, but we can see also in enterobacteria that is coming up something different. And the idea that uh, the pan-drug resistant or the multidrug resistant is a problem brings us to something that is to go back to the uh, pre-antibiotic era. We don't have new drugs active against these pathogens. What have in common pseudomonas and acinetobacter? I think that the resistance is the key in common for these two microorganisms. In both general resistance to multiple antibiotics is a rule, so they, uh, the, they are increasingly multidrug resistant or pan-drug resistant. Just two words on Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's a wide distributed organism, as you know. It's a member of a normal microbio Microbi microbial flora in humans, uh, and there is a, a different rate of colonization. But what is important is the hospitalization, because the colonization beca become very high, 50% of patients, and become a problem mm, because of the, of the state of the patient. Uh, for example, mm, who experience trauma or cutaneous mucosal breach or mechanical ventilation. This is uh, a problem of the patient that uh, is transferred into the microorganism. And uh, despite the distribution of pseudomonas aeruginosa that is very distributed in nature, in, a, in any kind of environment, but the problem is all in, absolutely in hospital infection. And if you look at this timetable that just uh, started in 1980 and finished in 2012, we don't know what can happen in the future, you can see that was, uh, for the microorganisms, there was a, 
just a slow but continuous accumulation of resistant determinants, starting from the MC cephalosporinase and going through different kinds of beta lactamase, including the extended spectrum, or um, the microorganisms face the porin change. It means the porin channel is uh, strict, so many drugs cannot enter into the bacteria and then reach the target. Aminoglycoside resistance, fluorquinolone resistance, and as you can see here, the, the era of metallocarbapenemase and cholestine resistant to bring to a pan-drug resistant phenotypes. And the, what the, is, uh, for example, this is a study in which uh, uh, the, there is the justification of what is uh, the behavior of the agency. We talked before about the important role in the indication of what uh, we have to do in, for treating patients from, uh, from the point of view of the agency. Uh, and this paper look at the activity of uh, piperacillin tazobactam in pseudomonas. Uh, probably you remember that the breakpoint was 64, uh, also for UCAS uh, until a few years ago. And if you look at this study, you can see uh, that piperacillin tazobactam in case of an MIC of 32 of 64 milligrams per liter has a high level uh, mortality rate, a 30-day uh, mortality rate. And if you look at the if you de decrease the MIC, the mortality is lower. So this is the reason when the, the clinical says something and the mortality is high because of the uh, breakpoint, obviously to lower the breakpoint means to save our patient. And this is what UCAS have done in this case. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a multidrug resistant pathogen. This is the Italian situation of four years net. Uh, as you can see here, the percentage of resistance are very high. But what is going on in this microorganism is this, this combined resistance. The combined resistance, I mean to five, five, four or five different classes of antibiotic is increasing. This is the date of 2008, so probably it, it is more. And uh, if you look at the situation of cafepim, you can see that uh, there is still a susceptibility very higher than for the third generation cephalosporin. And also amikacin is better than gentamicin. So the consequence can be that uh, the evaluation of this data can change the protocol in prophylaxis, for example, because we can use cafepim and amikacin instead of uh, uh, the use of uh, third generation uh, Keftazidim plus gentamicin. Uh, the few words that our time is very short, so I'm just flying on this problem on gram negative. As in Etrobacter Baumani, you can say that is a, a really an example of a multi drug resistant organism that has a clonal expansion. It means that few clones are distributed all around the world. Uh, this study was a study performed in Italy in 2004-2005, and there, there was another one, an Italian study, in 2008-2009. As you can see here, we have three different clones, A, B, C, and three different clones are the, almost the three European most important carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumani clones. It means that these clones are probably the same that you have in, in your country. And the, the only difference that we have found in the two periods of study is the, uh, the microorganisms have acquired more oxacillinase, and the, the oxacillinase is a, metal, is a beta lactamase able to uh, hydrolyze carbapenem in these species. So it means that we have different oxacillinase and the new one, oxa-23, uh, demonstrated to, to hydrolyze all carbapenem at high level. So no doubt that this is a, a terrible enzyme hydrolyzing carbapenem. Uh, the situation in Italy, uh, we perform a study just to see how, how is the prevalence of this microorganism. We have carbapenem resistant acinetobacter in all our country. All isolates were um, extra resistant and um, cholestine susceptible. And as you can see here, the prevalence is 43%. It's very high in our country, above all in lower respiratory tract infection and above all in ICU. So the, the problem still exists. And uh, l please look at this case in our hospital. This was a, a, 
pneumonia in a transplanted patient, that, that was the, uh, the microorganism isolates was uh, identified as uh, Acinetobacter uh, baumanni. Uh, as you can see here from the point of view of the uh, antibiogram, you, you don't have a lot of choice. The microorganism was a multidrug resistant, only cholestine susceptible. We performed the molecular characterization, the typing of the microorganism, and we found that it will possess OXA-23, so high level resistant to all carbapenem. So what we can do in this case, do you think that we have enough information to treat a patient? Do you use cholestine by himself, by itself alone? I think that the lab has to face this problem and say, okay, we need some more information to give to our clinician. So we can just uh, test another drug. For example, in this case, we were lucky because ampicillin surbactam was susceptible. So maybe we can use something susceptible and, and not only cholestine by it itself. Or the third thing that a laboratory can do is just to perform this simple test that is a, a combination test by, uh, by using a, a very nice method that is uh, to put together two e-tests in the MIC point and just to have some information about, about the combination test. And in this case uh, was cholestine plus rifampin. So the idea that the lab is not only producing an antibiogram, but, but can, can support uh, other tests to find the right solution is, uh, at the moment, uh, what I am saying. And the, but what is amazing, what is going on in uh, enterobacteria? Uh, as you can see here, starting with ampicillin resistance, we, we pass through different mechanisms uh, until the acquiring carbapenemase and uh, the carbapenemase are enzyme that hydrolyze carbapenem uh, also in the species. And the, the resistant trend issue, for example, the AirSNET database looking at the um, Italian data again, if you look at the third generation cephalosporin, you look also that there was, starting from 2007, an increase in multidrug resistant. Uh, this is the case of Klebsiella pneumonia, one of, one of the most important pathogens. And if you look here, starting from here, it's becoming evident also the resistance to carbapenem. So it's, it's becoming not only a problem of some isolates in some patients in some cases, but it's becoming epidemiologically important. Again, uh, when you find something like that, I, will, I, I show you different antibiogram recently published and also our cases. Uh, this was a case of uh, Nipsiella pneumonia and ST258. Again, now we are not talking about microorganisms, generally speaking, but multidrug resistant, very epidemic clone. So ST258 is a KPC producer, and the Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase producer is almost related to this clone. But now we have different clones coming, for example, from Israel and now uh, in Europe or in other countries that are very similar to ST258. As you can see here, starting from this uh, point in which uh, there was susceptibility to carbapenem, even if, uh, even if, I'm sorry, just to look, have a look at the MIC, at two, uh, so two is something that we have to think about. In this time when the paper was published, uh, probably the, the break point for UCAS was high. And you can see here that the microorganism was only susceptible to uh, cycling, but intermediate, sorry, to tigacycline and susceptible to cholestine. But look at this case. This was an intradominal infection just published in this paper. Uh, and the, the situation was very different. Only two drugs were useful, the gentamicin and cholestine. So this is a, a real producer of KPC, but also this one was a KPC producer, and the uh, cycling again uh, intermediate. And this is our case. We, we had an outbreak of uh, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia ST258 KPC producer, and in our case also cholestine was lost. So we miss also cholestine, and the, the, mm, the only 
accessibility was gentle mycin and tigacycline, again, intermediate. So the, the problem here is to identify what there is in the, in the microorganism. We, we perform in Italy some indication to perform, to give to the lab, to our colleague in the lab. I am involved not only in the UCAS subcommittee, but also in the committee in Italian uh, UCAS. And also, and we are giving some indication how to perform some tests, additional tests, to, uh, to give an idea of what there is, uh, what is the mechanism of resistance underlying the MIC, because in, in many cases, as I show you in the first case, Klebsiella pneumonia can have an MIC to meropenem that is not very high, so the, the the profile of susceptibility is just uh, something that is not true because the mechanism is underlined. Uh, so what we are talking about is high-risk multidrug-resistant clone. Uh, they have acquired multiple resistant determinants. They retain this propensity that is very important, uh, the cross-transmission and spreading all around, and they, they play a relevant role in infection and in nosocomial spread. So we have to face uh, this part. And our Italian surveillance put the 4% uh, of enterobacteria carbapenem resistant. We asked the laboratory for 25 cents to distribute in Italy for three months to give us all the strains that they supposed to be carbapenem resistant. So 4%. And we look, look at the species. We have 87% of Klebsiella, but also E. coli, enterobacter, Serratia. And the major mechanism as you can see here, is KPC. So KPC is the most distributed mechanism of resistance. And uh, so the, my, I am going directly to my few slides to go to the conclusion. And the, when we have severe infection and we have this kind of challenge, multidrug resistance, we, need, we have different problems. And the lab is still in the in the problem. Many colleagues said to me, okay, but you spend a lot of time to give me a result. And the, uh, so now you are asking, the situation is asking fast results. It's not in terms of day, but in terms of hours. The second thing is uh, the clinical micro lab has to be uh, aware of what the result can give. So the, the microorganisms have must have clinical significance. So the, micro, the microbiologist has to say, this is a colonizer, this is a pathogen in a very rapid time. The third thing is the, the microbiology lab updates uh, uh, local resistant patterns and trends. The fourth is uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Uh, we are doing that and also we are involved sometime in additional testing for being sure that there is a mechanism underlying uh, this uh, behavior. And uh, also, so what I'm saying, combination, residual activity of an antibiotic, uh, again. And uh, we have to identify this high-risk multidrug-resistant clone. So the, the, the microbiology lab has a new experience. So increasing workload. But in the same time, in our country at least, I, I think also in your country, we don't have uh, an increase in the number of technical staff. So the problem is that we are very, a lot of work to do and many, few people that can do this work and also that the diagnosis is complicated but all this complexity. So it means that we have to perform other tests. For example, if you ask us if this is a multidrug resistant ST258 clone, we cannot say only looking in the eyes of the Klebsiella pneumonia, we have to perform a, a molecular testing for doing that. So the workload of the lab is very high. But, you know, there is something in the future, I think so. There is something, this is just a, a flash on what, something new that is the mass spectrometry that is coming up in, uh, is not really, I'm, I know that is not really a real life because we still continue to have a manual and automatic system as we know. But uh, mass spectrometry is something that can, uh, can give us something, or can give you, or can give to the patient uh, something new, because the, the time 
uh, in which uh, an identification can arrive is very short. So there are different, different papers. Uh, if you look at the, at the having a colony, you can see that the, this kind of machine, I don't want to enter in this, put the same time to make a gram stain. So five minutes for a gram stain, six minutes, or in one hour you can have an identification. So the, the, the path is open for something that is uh, uh, more rapid, uh, and more uh, automatic. And also if you look at new papers coming yes. up in the literature, yes. I'm, I'm just closing. The, uh, there is the Malditoff experience for detection of resistance or the mutation of porin, or if you look at here, detection of ND1, NDM1, VIM1, uh, and different kind of carbapenemase in microorganisms. So this is my conclusion. Uh, Multidrug resistant ground negative is uh, a problem, but is also a problem in gram-positive. I, I am sure that uh, in this moment we are talking about gram-negative, but still I want to, to, to say that multidrug phenotypes in gram-positive are still important because of the mortality rate uh, in case of failure of uh, the therapy. Uh, gram-negative are now the major isolates in, in many infection and septics. Absolutely sure that we have complexity in, at behind, complexity in the phenotype, complexity in the patient, and I want to put your attention on the central role of the uh, clinical microbiology lab in, as making a decision in, in the team of making a decision for treatment, for treatment of the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Because we are running out of time, our idea is to make a general discussion after the four speakers. So now, please allow me, with my pleasure and privilege, to announce the next speaker, Professor Andrea Novelli, the president of FESCI. And as he is my boss, because I am the secretary general of FESCI, it's my pleasure, Andrea, to invite you to the podium. Your topic will be pharma, pharma, Uh, pharmacological aspects of uh, established treatment for MD MDR gram-negative rods. So, thank you, Krasi. Thank you for the organizer who gave me the possibility to be here in this uh, important Congress and to share with you today some opinion about the pharmacological problems we have with established drugs in gram-negative roads. So, uh, let me start with uh, a first slide. Uh, criteria for empiric antimicrobial choices. Stefania gave us a lot of information about the MDR um, strains for gram-negative strains, uh, Sinetobacter, uh, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and some uh, Klebsiella and other enterobacteria. And therefore, we have to look at the microorganism and think which kind of microorganism we might have, we might have in our infection due to the site of infection and the timing of infection. And therefore, we, the, the next is, is it a wild type or a multidrug resistant strains? Uh, why this kind of question? For, as you know, uh, the multidrug resistant strains are mainly present in the ICU, and the mortality in ICU is very high till today. One of the problems is that we lack new drugs, and we have to work with the drugs we have. And the problem in this, uh, uh, in this world, in the critically ill patients, is also that the drugs we have may have different pharmacokinetics in this kind of patients when we look at them in, in comparison to other kind of patients, which are the most uh, modification we may observe in pharmacokinetics. The first is the increased volume of distribution of our drugs. Why? For we have a modification of the fluid of the patients for the sepsis, for the trauma, for the severe hypoalbuminemia, and for fluid therapy, and so on. And we may have also fluid loss in burns or other kind of patients. Or we have, may have an accumulation of fluid in other side, uh, outside the blood. Second point is the uh, clearance. Many of our drugs have a, a variation in their clearance, and very often the clearance is increased. So our drugs are going out more rapidly. Why? 
for burns, but even for hyperdynamic sepsis phase or for SIRC, uh, the um, systemic inflammatory respiratory syndrome. Uh, so, uh, very often we have an increased volume of distribution and we have an increased uh, clearance. Therefore, when we deal with general pharmacokinetics of our compounds, we may see that for hydrophilic antibiotics, such as beta-lactams, for instance, you have low volume of distribution and low intracellular penetration with a predominant elimination by the renal system. While for lipophilic antibiotics, you get a high volume of distribution and you have a predominant hepatic clearance and very good intracellular penetration. Therefore, when you have an ICU patient, you have an increased volume of distribution, you have an increased clearance, and uh, in this case, when you look at the uh, hydrophilic antibiotics, you have modification for beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, cholestine, which are the most used antibiotics we have for uh, gram-negative roads, while uh, minor modifications are observed for lipophilic antibiotics, such as tigecycline, which is another um, compound we may use in combination uh, with our other antibiotics for the treatment of gram-negative roots. So, what do we have? We have in, uh, definitely that even for uh, um, uh, lipophilic drugs such as quinolones or mainly for hydrophilic uh, drugs such as beta-lactams and piperacillins, the tissue distribution of these antibiotics is going to be lower and lower depending on the score of your patients. More severe the patients, lower the tissue distribution of the drugs. And so if we deal with the anti antimicrobial drugs, which are divided, as you, every one of you knows very well, in two major groups, those with a concentration-dependent activity and those with a time-dependent activity, we may observe some differences between this kind of drugs looking at the best parameter for correlating the efficacy, which is C-max MIC ratio, for instance, for aminoglycosides, or T uh, concentrations higher than the MIC during the administration for beta-lactams, or AUC MIC ratio, which is uh, commonly uh, important for some concentration dependent drugs such as quinolones or daptomycin, and such time dependent drugs such as tigecycline. So, let us see in the next few minutes some examples we may have with the different drugs, starting with beta-lactams. So, beta-lactams are time dependent drugs. Time-dependent killing is therapeutically achievable, uh, is um, obtained by therapeutically achievable concentrations, minimal to moderate persistent antibiotic effect, no post-antibiotic effect. And so it is important to maximize the duration of exposure to optimize the effects. And time above the MIC is the dominant pharmacodynamic index. So how we have to use our beta-lactams. Short dosing intervals or continuous infusion, I guess that one of the best ways to use this kind of drugs is continuous infusion, but nowadays we may use prolonged infusion, which means we give this kind of drugs uh, with a, a, an infusion uh, lasting three to four hours. And let me give you some of examples. Starting with cephalosporins, carbapenems, piperacillin tazobactam, if we look what happens with a normal infusion, a, f a very short infusion, this is the possibility of obtaining a, a good result. If you use a prolonged infusion, you have better results. But let me see, for instance, for cefepime. Uh, Stefania said something about cefepime and its activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You see that when you use a prolonged infusion, you gain a percentage of possible successful treatment from 67, but this is a very low dose, to, uh, let, the, let me see, 2 gram every 8 hours, 74 to 80%. But what's happened? The, the importance is the MIC. You see here that when you use, this is a very low dose, when you use a one gram every eight hour, you are in this way to 
uh, have a probability of target attainment uh, for your patient, so you, you need to have an MIC non higher than four. If you use one gram every six hours, you are in a better position. Perhaps you may have an MIC of eight, but if you are going to use two gram every eight hours, here you have the uh, orange uh, line, or every six hours, the a yellow line, you have an MIC threshold of 16. That it means that in this kind of patients you may use this kind of drug even at, with a higher MIC and having a good result. The same is for piperacillin and tazobactam. You see here what's happened in this kind of patients we, uh, who uh, has a, a gram-negative road as one of the major pathogens for their infection. You see here continuous infusion uh, in, uh, correlated to, in, uh, to st uh, um, fast infusion. You see that the cure is different. 90% here and only 56% here. But if you look at the MIC, you see that if the MIC is only 4 or less than 4 milligrams, there are no very big differences in the two treatments. The importance is the MIC. When you deal with an MIC of 8 or 16 with peperacillin and tazobactam, if you use continuous infusion or prolonged infusion, you get a 90% possibility of success while you have only 17 to 40% in the normal way of administration. And moreover, it's the same also for carbapenems. You see here meropenem and continuous versus uh, uh, intermittent infusion in ventilator-associated pneumonia due to gram-negative bacilli. What we have to see, uh, starting with the all cases, you see that continuous infusions give 90% results, clinical cure rates, while the other normal way to administer these drugs give you 60%. But if you look at the microorganism, you see that when you deal with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, if you use uh, meropenem in the classical way, you have only a possibility of a 40% of clinical cure, while if you use it with a continuous or prolonged infusion, you have an 84%. And therefore, the other point is the MIC. When the MIC is higher, the possibility of uh, good clinical results with continuous infusion is statistically very highly significant than in terminal infusion. So, this is for belalactams. Let's we move to uh, aminoglycosides. Why aminoglycosides? For since we have a lot of resistance with fluoroquinolones, we need to use aminoglycosides in combination with belalactams often than in the um, um, past when we used fluoroquinolones. Aminoglycosides are concentration-dependent drugs, and nowadays we have to use them, uh, let me say gentamicin, tobramycin, nethylmycin, at least at 10 mg uh, per kilo of, uh, as a normal dose once every 24 hours. But if you look at the MIC, you see that even using this high dose, you may gain a, a good result only if your MIC is ab about 1%. So, if we look what's happening in your patient, you see that when you uh, deal with aminoglycosides and a very, very low MIC, 0.25 mg per liter, you are capable to cure all your patients, this is the cure rate, without any kind of toxicity. This is the toxicity uh, line. You see, you, you cure almost 90% of the patients without uh, nephrotoxicity. If the, MI, the MIC is 0.5, you can uh, cure all your patients, but you may deal with some toxicity. However, when the MIC is one milligram per liter, if you want to treat all your patients, you have to deal with more than 50% of toxicity for nephrotoxicity. So that's why we have to look carefully in the use of aminoglycosides in combination with other um, uh, antimicrobial drugs for the problem of dosage and toxicity. And let me go to the partner drugs. I will give you a few comments on two partner drugs. One is tigecycline and the other is cholistin. 
Tigecycline um, is a time-dependent drug. It needs an AUC MIC ratio for gram-negative roads of almost seven to be effective. And you saw in the data presented by Stefania that for Ashtonetobacter very often Tigecycline has a high MIC of 1.5 or more. Therefore, if you look at the predictive points for a clinical success with tigecycline, you see there is the severity of infections. So you need the patients with not a very severe infections. And the other point is the AUC-MIC ratio. It must be higher than 3.1. And therefore, tisicycline is a good drug in combination. And at the last ICAC meeting in Chicago last year, there was this very interesting paper presented by an Italian group, the GMAMA Infection Program Group, that demonstrated that in almost 300 patients, they observed a 74% of successful outcome in 160 patients when they used the combination of tisicycline plus piperacillin tazobactin. Them. While using only the beta lactam, they got a 47% of success. So, therefore, the conclusion of this group and the conclusion and the suggestion that we may have as a, a uh, chemotherapist is that you have to use tigecycline in combination, per, per, uh, for instance, with beta lactam or so other drugs to have a very high um, percentage of success. And my last drug is cholestine. You know that cholestine is a concentration-dependent drug. So you have to use cholestine in the same way you are going to use daptomycin or aminoglycosides. You have to use cholestine with a very high dose and very few administration during the day. And uh, one of the problems with cholestine is that you need at least uh, four milligram per uh, liter as the concentration at the site of infection to have a killing activity. Otherwise, if you have a very low concentration, the problem is that you have a, um, a, um, a failure. And the problem with cholestine is that you are not going giving to the patient cholestine, but you give it as a prodrug is cholimestate. And when you start with cholimestate, for instance, 3 million uh, units, which is the normal, one of the normal uh, doses you use uh, in uh, clinics, you see here that at the first dose you have a very, very low uh, concentration of cholestine, and you may be uh, capable of achieving good concentrations only after the fourth dose, and let me say after 48 hours. Therefore, we have to use one cholestine. One minute left. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, this is my last uh, slide before conclusion. Therefore, we have to use cholestine in a different way, with a loading dose, perhaps 9 million uh, units, and you have this kind of curve, and uh, follow it by 4.5 uh, um, million uh, twice a day, and which is the result that after the first dose, you have this kind of concentrations of cholestine in your patients, and you are capable to be in the effective range of the drug. So, my final slide is this. What can be done in the clinical setting? Um, fo uh, focusing our, our treatment, even for gram-negative or gram-positive uh, uh, strains, we have to keep in mind these points. Know the target pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic parameter for the specific drug in use. So if it's a concentration drug, you have to use it with a, a, a high AUC or PKMIC ratio. If it's a, a time-dependent drug, you have to use it with prolonged or a continuous infusion. Select the most appropriate administration modality, and I'll give you some example for, uh, for the different drugs. Maximize the dosing, especially in severe ill patients, according, of course, to renal function, but the importance is to kill the, uh, the bug. This is the first uh, point we have as, uh, um, in the antimicrobial treatment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. And now it's again my privilege and pleasure to announce the next speaker, Professor Teresita Matsei, the president of the International Society of Chemotherapy. Her topic will be new perspectives and new drugs for M MRD gram-negative rods. Thank you, Klaas. <clears throat> the aim of my presentation today is to illustrate 
and to discuss with you new perspectives and new drugs for this difficult to treat infection. As you know, uh, the new antibacterial agents approved in the last uh, years, at least uh, in the last 10 years, has dramatically decreased. As you can see from this slide, in the last, let me say, 10 years, very few new compounds, antibacterial compounds, have been approved and are in the marketing today, and the last two or three anti antibiotics are antibiotics active against uh, gram-positive bacteria, such uh, daptomycin, telavancin, of septarolin. What is new about gram-negative compounds? What is the pipeline? We have uh, several many, many new compounds that are on preclinical phases of research. We have about eight or nine compounds in phase one clinical trial and almost six compounds uh, active uh, uh, in, in phase two clinical trials. What about the carbapenems, you know the carbapenems are the most active drugs, at least in general, that are less susceptible to the hydrolysis of extended spectrum beta-lactamase. What is new about carbapenems? Uh, you know that uh, the most recently approved drug was doripenem, that is, let me say, almost equal to meropenem or imipenem. It's in the middle. No, uh, so advantage, at least from the clinical point of view. And you know that uh, in some European countries, like Italy, doripenem is not in the marketing. Uh, there are drugs that are approved only in Asiatic countries. Not so exciting, at least from a pharmacodynamic point of view. We have at least four drugs that are actually in the phase two trials, but again, let me say, not so attractive, at least to solve the problem of the most resistant gram-negative strains. What about new drugs that are on the new classes uh, of antimicrobial agents, so different mechanism of action. This compound, KB001, is a very interesting compound. It's an antibody fragment uh, with a very specific action directed against a, a protein, a secretory protein produced by uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa that is active uh, to secrete uh, exotoxins. So this antibody fragment uh, can improve or can decrease the pathogenicity of only Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Also, these polymixing compounds are very attractive because they are almost equal uh, as a point of view of activity uh, in comparison with colistin, but they are less, less toxic. Also, this protein synthesis inhibitor is quite interesting because it's a, uh, it has a broad spectrum of activity against E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, Pseudomonas, and uh, Acinetobacter. Uh, uh, a new tetracycline. These are agents, the bisin dolls, that are active against DNA of gram-negative bacteria. And uh, uh, this class of inhibitors of these proteins, LPXC, that is an acetylase that is uh, involved in the process of uh, lipopolysaccharides that are, you know, very important in the uh, external 
uh, involucres of gram negatives. These are very interesting. And also the new, these new antibacterial agents that is a molecule that contain a boron atom and uh, it's an inhibitor of TRNA synthetase that is actually on the phase two clinical trials is very interesting. And uh, this was a communication on the last uh, ExMed meeting in London. There is something uh, very exciting or interesting uh, on the class of uh, beta-lactamase inhibitors. You can see here um, uh, uh, a list of uh, many molecules that are in preclinical or in the first phase of de development. This compound from Pfizer is very interesting, and also other compounds that are inhibitor of class, class A beta-lactamase or C or D. And this is a new carbapenems, not very interesting, let me say. And this is another one with a, a, a very um, innovative structure, is a cider for monobactam plus another monobactam or plus clavulanate could become interesting. But uh, these non-beta-lactams, beta-lactamase inhibitors is probably the most interesting one is um, the, the research started with Novexel and now uh, is continuing with AstraZeneca. Uh, this compound could restore the beta-lactam activity against enterobacteriaceae producing class A enzyme or C or D or some class D enzymes, uh, but uh, is not active against class B enzymes. And you can see here very interesting MIC value that are uh, very low in comparison with the MIC of septacidim alone. So if this NXL compounds is combined with septacidim, he can restore the activity mainly against E. coli or Klebsiella species, Enterobacter, and uh, against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's, it's not so active against Acinetobacter. And you can see here, here in a, a septicemia model in mice that uh, the combination of uh, this inhibitor plus septazidim could be better, uh, significantly better in comparison with septazidim alone. In this model uh, with uh, uh, Eclipsella pneumoniae KPC producing. So this is a really interesting drug that is currently in phase two study for the treatment of complicated urinary tract infection and uh, intra-abdominal infection. Another interesting compound is uh, a, a new intravenous cephalosporins that could, can be combined, interestingly, with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Uh, their activity is very uh, good. Uh, you can see here in this table, and uh, is, uh, this activity is also demonstrated in murine animal models. These are uh, the first phase of pharmacokinetics in healthy volunteer, and the cur current status is phase two, complicated urinary tract infection and complicated intra-abdominal infection. A new, a new very interesting uh, compound is also these aminoglycosides, plazomycin, that is resistant to all aminoglycoside modifying enzymes and uh, with a very broad antimicrobial spectrum. 
And this compound is in the phase two study for the indication of complicated urinary tract infection. He has a very interesting synergistic activity combined with cefepin, doripenem, and piperacil in tazopabactam. Nothing new about pharmacokinetics, but this uh, pharmacodynamic is very interesting. Synergy with cefepin, piptazo, and also with all carbapenem. So, so this could be very interesting to combine with other drugs. In conclusion, uh, clinicians, you know very well, are facing with a dramatic shortage in the av availability of new therapeutic option. With all compounds that I illustrated you, uh, these compounds could be available perhaps not, not before three, four, or five years, uh, could be in the clinical practice. So what, what is the best strategy to, today? I think the most important uh, uh, relation in this symposium has been that uh, of Andrea Novelli, how to use better our drugs, the, the drugs that you have in clinical practice today, how to use this, this better, probably continuous infusion or prolonged infusion with beta lactams. Uh, to use better concentration-dependent drugs and to take into the consideration all the variations that are in the critically ill patients. So new drugs will be available not before three, four, or probably five years. So use better the drugs that you have uh, today in the clinical practice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Teresita. And now the last speaker. It's again my privilege to announce George Petricus, the president of the Mediterranean Society. He will talk about clinical aspects of the resistant gram-negative infections in the hospital setting. George. Thank you, Gracie, for the introduction, and thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity as Mediterranean Society of Chemotherapy to participate in this uh, nice meeting and share with you uh, my lecture about clinical aspects of the resistant gram-negative infections in the hospital setting. Uh, we all know this uh, publication about the bad bugs and no drugs, no escape and in escape case Klebsiella pneumonia, A is Acinetobacter baumani, B Pseudomonas serotonosa, and D Enterobacteria so those are all gram-negative resistant uh, drugs. Uh, the relation between the antimicrobial resistance and the patient outcome uh, relates to the mortality, length of hospital stay, and the health cost. And it is obvious by several publications that the uh, probability of death is higher in these, uh, uh, these infections. Uh, then longer duration of hospitalization has been proved and the, uh, and the consequence of that is the increased hospital cost. In uh, Europe, uh, ECDC uh, estimated that about 37,000 patients die as a direct consens, uh, consequence and an additional 11, uh, 1,000 uh, 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 one, uh, one, 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 one die as an indirect consequence of hospital acquired infection each year in the EU. Uh, each year, 25,000 patients die in the Europe from an infection caused by multidunker resistance, and of those deaths, two-thirds are due to gram negative bacteria. Infections due to any of the selected antibiotic resistant bacteria resulted in approximately 2.5 million extra hospital days. 
Looking for the mortality in ESBL producing Klebsiella pneumonia bacteremia, we see that if we have uh, resistance to uh, uh, beta lactamase inhibitors, the uh, uh, old case mortality in 14 days uh, is about 50%. If we look to the cephalosporin monotherapy, 40% die and if we have quinolone monotherapy, 36.3, while carpapenes monotherapy is only, uh, only 3.7. Most of the publications regarding this uh, carpapenemes producing pathogens uh, are coming first from Israel and then from Greece and some other studies that uh, show that the infection by this carpapenes producing uh, pathogens leads to a higher uh, morbidity and mortality. And in Israel, it is published that about eight patients out of 100,000 population die because of the KPC infections. In Greece, we estimate that 10 patients out of 100 population are dying from this KPC bacteria. In our institution, we publish this uh, paper in a prospective observational study of the impact of VIM1 metalobita lactamase on the outcome of patients with Klebsiella pneumonia uh, blood stimic infection and it was clear that if we have uh, uh, the uh, sorry The VIM uh, with higher than 4 mg per ml, the Kaplan-Meier uh, curves show that this, the uh, community survivor is decreasing in these uh, patients. And uh, the Cox regression analysis of factors associated with all cases in 14, 14 days mortality show that the MIC of carpapenems higher than 4 mg per pyramid are uh, uh, increasing the fatality. And uh, if you look at the mortality rates according to the treatment regimen, you can see that if we don't use drugs, the uh, mortality rate is high, close to 30%. If we use one drug, the uh, mortality is about the same, but if we use a combination by two active drugs, we uh, decrease the mortality rate uh, uh, very much. Uh, the conclusion of, uh, our of, of our study is that in patients with Klebsiella pneumonia, bacteremia, st uh, bacteremia uh, st uh, uh, infections, uh, in Klebsiella pneumonia, in carbapenem resistant advantage age, the severity of underlying disease were independent factors of adverse outcome, uh, whereas VIM productions had no impact on mortality. The higher mortality observed in patients affected with VIM positive carbapenem resistant organisms uh, and was probably mediated by the failure to provide effective antimicrobial therapy. As uh, uh, KPC, as, uh, uh, KPC emerges as a life-threatening pathogen in Klebsiella's. It is critical to develop diagnostic, and we heard about that from Stefania, and therapeutic strategies, and we heard this about from uh, Andrea, to ensure timely and effective treatment of infection caused by such organisms. More importantly, is an urgent need to implement enhanced infection control measures to contain their dissemination as we have no new drugs as the Resida described previously. Uh, looking to these uh, different publications, uh, we see that the presence of uh, KPC in Klebsiella is an independent mortality risk factor 
Then the overall mortality is about 44 to 68 percent. The risk of KPC uh, bacteremia increase in patients with a high Apache 2 score. Uh, another publication showed that the attributable mortality is 6.5 and the adjusted mortality or is 2.16 and these 12 excess deaths caused by antibiotic resistant infection alone. Here we see the, these results that it is obvious for, that for Apache free score with similar severity we have a double mortality in infection due to multi-drug resistance uh, infections. Uh, in this study, we see the impact of antibiotic resistance on mortality, length of hospital staying and cost, and it is obvious that the impact of this uh, of the resistance strains increase the, uh, the risk of death in Pseudomonas, Enterobacter, Acinetobacter, and ESB producing or KPC producing as it is called or Klebsiella. And the attributable length of stay, of course, is higher as uh, higher is the cost of all these resistance strains. Uh, yeah. If we look to Klebsiella pneumonia bacteremia, uh, the attributable mortality rate is higher compared to the control we have a crude mortality 23% and the attributable mortality 16% while in the control the crude mortality was only 7%. In the, uh, these uh, authors concluded that the patients with carbapenem resistant Klebsiella pneumonia require more intensive and invasive care and they have shown that uh, the crude and attributable mortality rates associated with carbapenem resistant Klebsiella pneumonia and bacteria were striking. Another uh, study uh, showed that the death, the length of hospital stay and the delay, uh, and daily hospital charges uh, increase in patients with resistance at baseline or patients with emergence of resistance uh, during treatment. Uh, in uh, uh, this study, enterobacteriosis species, according to the multivariate analysis, it was also proved that death uh, lengths of, of hospital staying and hospital charge are increasing in patients with emergence of resistance, and uh, this was statistically significant. Uh, another study, another review study that uh, include all the previous published studies about the impact of gram-negative bacteria resistance on outcome in the intensive care units showed that uh, comparing to the control, the uh, crude uh, analysis uh, is uh, in the cases compared to the control were much, much higher uh, in all these publications, as uh, continues shown from all these studies, we see that the difference is obvious. And uh, these uh, all studies uh, concluded that despite the limitation of previous studies and, the, and this quantitative review, the collective, uh, collective findings suggested that gram-negative bacterial resistance in the ICU may be associated with increased mortality and hospital length of stay, which in turn are associated with increased patient charges or hospital cost. Uh, uh, final study uh, looking to the outcome of carbapenem resistant Klebsiella pneumonia uh, blood steam infection uh, show the same thing, that the uh, mortality, the infection-related mortality in the uh, hospital stake than the total uh, uh, length of hospital staying in uh, median days was much higher in, uh, 
uh, SBL and KBC compared to the sensitive Klebsiella uh, pneumonia infections. Uh, and this was also proved by the statistical analysis uh, that the carbovenemone resistance and the SBL production is a factor associated with higher mortality cost. And in conclusion, they say that they found that carbapenem resistance of Klebsiella pneumonia was associated with decreased mortality. Their findings reinforce the urgent efforts of, uh, needed to prevent the spread of carbapenems measures producing endobacteria in the hospital and the intensive care unit. And I close with three slides that uh, show the impact of the resistance on mortality, length of uh, hospital stay and hospital cost. And uh, from all that this data that I presented before, with regard to the outcomes, morbidity and cost rather than mortality may be the most sensitive measures with which uh, to quantify the impact of antimicrobial resistance. The perspective for an outcome study determines the endpoints measured and affects how the economic impact of infections with resistant organ, uh, organisms is estimated. Current evidence suggests that the infections caused by SBL producing endobacteriaceae are associated with decreased hospital length of stay and cost. Also, bacteremia stem infections caused by SBL producing endobacteriaceae are associated with increased rates of mortality. MDR pseudomonas aerosinosa resistant to four or more and if one agents is associated with decreased mortality and decreased hospital length of stay. For us in the species, uh, last infections and nosocomial intensive care unit infections caused by carbapenem resistant isolates are associated with increased rate of mortality. So, carbapenem resistant and bacteriaceae are a major public health threat because they increased the mortality 25 to 70 percent. They leave us as limited treatment options as no new drugs are available in our armamentarium. So we go to the old drugs cholestine and phosphomycin and the high potential for spread that uh, force us to take control measurements when we have such cases. So in conclusion, we can say that morbidity and mortality attributable to infections due to, to the resistant gram-negative bacteria is significant. If prevailing resistant trends continue, high societal and economical costs can be expected. And as we are passing an economic crisis, this is very important for us, especially in Greece. So we need better management and infection control of infections caused by these uh, resistant gram-negative bacteria in, 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 and it is becoming essential in our hospital setting. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, George. You can stay to the podium because we have now the general discussion. Uh, all the uh, relations are open for discussion. Any questions, comments from the audience? I, I have, a, I have oh. a question to Andrea. Andrea, in one of your slides, you stated that uh, the timing and the dose will be increased in severe cases uh, with regard to the, to the renal functions. Uh, do you have some special measures for renal and liver functions, or you are using the routine examinations? Microphone. No, it's working. 
So I was looking for the microphone. Uh, <laughs> usually, you, you can use the normal uh, routinary systems. I, even the transformation of the creatinine value in the blood with the uh, Crawford uh, formula Formula. Is, might be sufficient to give you an idea. However, in uh, my experience and in our experience with Teresita and our uh, colleagues in the um, intensive care units, we see that even when you may have the idea that your patients might have a reduced uh, renal function, um, if you deal with uh, an acute um, septic patient, very often uh, from the second or third days of treatment, you may have an increased clearance of the drug. So very often we are afraid of having a uh, reduced uh, uh, renal function, um, but in, uh, in real life this is not. How about liver functions? I'm sorry? Liver. How about liver? Oh, about liver. Liver function. You see that with the drug we are going to use, the liver functions is not the measure point we have to look at. Okay. Please, microphone two. Thank you very much for the excellent presentations. Actually, I have a question that I, uh, I will require opinions from each of the uh, speakers. You, you know, CLSI and uh, UCAST have made some changes with the breakpoints and all of us have suddenly, uh, you know, astonished with the change in the breakpoints because we were now required to, to report ESBL producing cephalosporins as sensitive to or, or just to report whatever you find in the susceptibility test. So my question is that do any of the speakers have any experience regarding treatment of say ESPL producing enterobacteriaceae with ceftazidime or cefepim after the recent changes, or treatment of uh, uh, carbapenem maize producing bugs with carbapenems when susceptible, when the MIC is in the susceptible range. Thank you. Uh, Stefan. Oh, George. Uh, there's, uh, there is a publication for Jill Dykos about the a possibility of uh, a combination of uh, aminoglycoside and uh, uh, carbapenem uh, or azreonam that may be acting. These are the only uh, drugs that could be used uh, uh, except the phosphomycin and uh, uh, cholestine that are uh, nowadays are uh, in some, there are many and include that, uh, m m many uh, uh, publications, but there's not a clinical trial. Now we are running in FP71 clinical trial with this, these old drugs to see what can we do, in, especially in KPC producing Glepsialis and the ASBL resistance. But I have no experience about uh, third generation cephalosporins. Stefania. Even if I think that is a very complex question, thank you, because uh, you point out uh, a very important problem, that is the lowering the, the, the indication of the agency to, uh, to report the date that you obtain uh, without looking at the mechanism. And so this is a problem, for example, in two different ways, I think. The extended spectrum, the problem is uh, with CT exam mechanism because CT exam result in our uh, experience as susceptible to one of the captazidim, as you're right. So the, the problem is that in, in our experience in Italy, we ask uh, laboratories to continue to look at the test uh, for extended spectrum beta lactamase presence, because uh, it is difficult to indicate a captazidim if in bacteremia, for example. Probably you can use in uh, urinary tract infection, but it, it's not, not in a severe infection. But we, as, as George pointed out, we don't have any study that indicate to use uh, a cephalosporin if there is a, a mechanism underlying. The second point is uh, the carbapenem. This is another huge problem because um, the 
breakpoint, even if the agency lowered the breakpoint, still UCAST has a high breakpoint, in my mm. opinion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree. Uh, because it's, with this breakpoint, you cannot detect some of the, for example, OXA 48, uh, VIM 1 mechanism. So the indication in this case is when you have an, an MIC of 0 0.5 to meropenem, that is the, considered the most stable drug to these enzymes, uh, the laboratory have to look or to point, to put a note and say maybe there is something in the, in the strain. And the combination therapy, as George uh, uh, just said, maybe is the only one possible. Because if you look at the, the, uh, some data, you look that uh, in combination, even if you have a resistant phenotype, uh, and you put another drug active, uh, the patient can survive. So the, the, the result is, the outcome is good. So I, again, we need to talk, the lab and the clinician. Thank you, uh, Stefani uh, Andrea. Uh, very, very few words. Uh, one of the problems is uh, uh, combination therapy. And for instance, if you, if you deal with an MIC for carbapenems, which is high and out of the uh, susceptibility range, but is still possible, let me say 8 mg per liter, for instance, for imipenem, very often better than for meropenem, you may uh, use a combination therapy. And sometimes you have to use imipenem and gentamicin plus colistin and phosphomycin, which is one of the drugs we are uh, looking uh, again to, and you have to use very huge doses. And uh, for instance, for phosphomycin, you have to use four grams every six hours to, to have a, a success. But you have to use three, four, perhaps, uh, drugs in combination. Um, I have a question from Professor Mazzi, maybe. Uh, I have a question you. for... Uh, oh, I understood from your talks that we have limited options uh, for new drugs against uh, gram-negatives. Uh, what is the situation uh, uh, for natural antibiotic products against these bugs? Is there any possibility to develop? Are you asking me about natural compounds? Yes, there are some very interesting new peptides that are obtained, for example, from the skin of some animals, frogs or something uh, similar animals, but they are in a very, very preclinical stage of development. So we know very, very few data about some uh, antimicrobial activity. They are interesting. You know that research on the field of uh, natural compounds, at least for peptides, is very long history, but uh, we don't have uh, any compounds that uh, have reached the marketing. Uh, I don't know if you have any experience uh, with other natural compounds. I don't know. Plants, you mean herbal extracts? Uh, I'm not prepared on this field. We have got some results uh, in vitro, and then we used uh, on animal models. It worked very good on the skin model of infections. We are thinking to use them probably uh, on respiratory infection, but we have no idea. Uh, do you have any idea or uh, any new information about usage of these natural products to control the infections? But, probably in the future at hospitals. But which, which kind of natural compounds? Because there is a word of natural compounds. Yeah, some uh, medicinal plants in our oh, country. Plants, yes. yeah. 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 Thank you. Oh, there is another question. Previous, you and you, and then we have to stop. Thank you very Sorry. much. I have two questions. One is for you, one is uh, George. Firstly, uh, you explained that uh, resistant microorganisms leads to an extra hospital cost. Can you give us uh, some figures, some examples from European countries? That is very important for us in Turkey. We can discuss our authorities. That is very important. 
uh, you told us uh, there is no any new drugs, new antibiotics in five or ten years. You are right. Uh, in our intensive care units in Turkey, in the Middle East, and uh, probably in Europe, uh, we have only two antibiotics working now. One is colistin, uh, second is tigacycline. In our intensive care units, many microorganisms are, are uh, increasing and resistant. What will you do during this period? Thank you very much. Yes, George. All right. In our intensive care units, and sometimes we lost even cholestine. We have strains that are almost resistant to all antibiotics. What can we do? We don't know. We just try to uh, keep the patient alive, keep the patient isolated. But, you know, in intensive care unit, how easy it is to keep this strains uh, away from the other patients. What we uh, do in our uh, intensive care unit in Greece is we, uh, we, st we start testing the colonization. And uh, when we have uh, indication that a patient with fever without before being uh, bacteremic we try to uh, treat him with combination of the drugs that I mentioned before. But uh, we are now in the era of the post-antibiotic era, and uh, actually we try to keep the patient uh, alive, but without antibiotics, because we have no, nothing. I it's think George uh, has already answered to the question that you have to me, of course, you have to use better and better the antibiotics that you have with the combinations, as already uh, Andrea Novelli pointed out, perhaps four antibiotics altogether, colistin plus phosphomycin, gentamicin, or a beta-lactam, tigercycline, sometimes and you have to use, or at least to, to, to use also collaboration with the other uh, colleagues, such uh, clinical pharmacologists, because sometimes therapeutic drug monitoring could be very useful for your very severely ill patients. Probably you are pessimistic, not 10 years, probably three, four, or five years. It depends, it depends from the compound. Yes, please, the last question. Did you raise the hands? No? Any, if there are any other questions, we can uh, conclude the thanking all the speakers for the very interesting presentation and all the audience for the attention. Thank you again.